gentlemen okay this week is special it's a bonus episode of the paul pod for curtain call two and we have Uh a special guest Uh broadcasting live from detroit Mm -hmm. you've got so many names i don't know which one to start with i know i always do that to y'all let's start with (laughs) mr porter yeah (laughs) that works the nine porter yeah con artist yep there's more yeah, Nani Cakes every once in a while. Nani, th- those are the three main main names. Yeah. Broadcasting live from Detroit for a special bonus edition of the Paul Pod. Welcome to the show. I am honored to be yes, here. Yes, it's wonderful to have you. And as you know, we've been going through Marshall's, basically his career, but focusing on sort of post- Encore days and the albums leading up to the Curtain Call 2 Greatest Hits compilation. And you, my friend, play a big part in a lot of that material. So we didn't want to wrap this up without having talked to you. Now, I know that most of this conversation is going to be about you and your relationship with Marshall, Mm -hmm. but there's some stuff I want to get out of the way about you because it's important to the conversation. Let's do it. Okay. So in doing my research, even though I've known you for quite some time, yeah. I learned something that I was not aware of. What's that? You were born in North Carolina. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not an original. You're not a native born yeah. Detroiter. <laughs> no. Tell me about that. Cause I didn't know how'd that happen. My mom is from North Carolina. My dad was born in Detroit. I was born in North Carolina and I was like there for Man, I can't even tell you because, like, I would come here to go to school. Obviously, go back back to North Carolina, right? Probably. Up well, what I saw is, you know, Wikipedia, which you know is always a hundred percent right. Just yeah. kidding. <laughs> it's just kidding. And it said that you right. lived there until you were about ten, but that mm-hmm. at some point you had moved also to Mississippi. Well, Mississippi was the summers, so I just ah, did, okay. Yeah, we didn't have a house, so it was like a. I was splitting the time in between North Carolina and Mississippi for a long time. Then got we it. finally got a house. Then we moved. Then so I moved you would, back. <laughs> you would go and visit family in the summer in Mississippi and then come back to North Carolina. But anyway, you end up in Detroit some point mm-hmm. around 10 years old. And then, you know, there's a there's a gap in time by, by the time you meet Marshall, obviously. Yeah. So tell me about a little bit about your sort of musical background in that time. What What got you enthralled with hip hop and started working as a producer and artist. What was it? Benita Apple Bomb. So there's you can pinpoint this to one specific song. Yeah, for me it was that because even with NWA and BC Boys and I ended up going back and yep. discovering that stuff. It was Benita Apple Bomb. I was like, oh that's it. It's and I can't remember what year that was. When I met him, I honestly was only doing beats probably three months. <laughs> right. And so, so Benita Applebaum, I, I, without looking it up, just based on my recollection, mm-hmm. I'm going to guess is about 90 or 91. Mm-hmm. Sound about yeah. right? Yep. Okay. So that's a very specific. What about that song in particular? Was it the production, the rapping, just the whole vibe? Like, what, what was it? It felt like, it felt like, obviously, I was living in an aggressive environment. In Detroit. Yeah. Right. So with it being that, it was the thing that felt completely different. Mm -hmm. And it was like non, it it, it felt like it was refreshing, but it was also like, it felt more like me. Right. You know, it was like a soulful, I come from a soulful background. My dad is a singer. He's, and and him and my grandfather, Mm -hmm. that's how he met my mother. My grandfather's one of the original five blind boys of Alabama. Well, that is pretty amazing. And Five Blind Boys of Alabama, is, is that blues or, or gospel? No, that's, that's gospel. 
Gospel. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. So and that being my background, that was like, it just felt right. Sure. You know? And it makes total like, sense. That was it. So it was more of a vibey thing. It was more of a soulful thing. Mm -hmm. And you connected with it more. And the light may have gone off in your head. And you said, oh, there's hip hop like this. And yeah. I can relate to this. Mm -hmm. And maybe I can even make this. Yeah, because I couldn't listen to. I got in trouble for listening to NWA. and We all did. Yeah, right? Yeah. I got in trouble for it. And I was like, I could listen to this. It's not, you know, I'm not going to get in trouble for this. But it felt like I could, you know. Even though Benita it, Applebaum you know? was talking about a girl with in her butt. Exactly. But just in code words. So if like if Completed. your parents weren't paying attention, they wouldn't really know. If they really paid attention and they really knew what time it was. They didn't know what Jimmy they was. They didn't know what I was doing. Or Jimmy Hats were. <laughs> Jim Hats fell. <laughs> Any of that, right? <laughs> they didn't know what that was, bro. Right. So so you get inspired by Benita Applebaum, and what do you start doing first? Are you writing as a as a rapper or singer or producer or all of the above or what? Well, I had already been my dad would line us up and make us sing. Like he would he line would you up? Singing. Yeah, we but my, me, my brother, and my sister. Okay. He would line us up and we, everybody had they they had their tone and they had they you gotta stay in your lane. Don't get out of that. So were you like harmonizing? <laughs> yep. Wow. Uh-huh. So I was already doing that, but it wasn't like I was doing it in front of people, I was doing it at home. And he just wanted you to do it because he wanted you to have that skill? No, nah, it was just like, he was just messing around. Like, for fun? And, <laughs> yeah, it was for fun. Okay. Yeah, and then All I right. would watch them in their shows at church and stuff, and I was like, man, this is actually cool, but I don't know if I could do that. Because, you right. know, just being shy. So but you sing you sing a lot in a falsetto. And is, is, is that what you were doing back then as well? No. Uh, okay. I didn't discover that until... I kind of discovered that through Rich and M, my friend Rich and and, and Marshall. They okay. kind of like would always be like, "Yo, you can sing, you should do it." And yeah. I was just always well, they messing were right, around. and you're because your dad taught you how. So, yeah. <laughs> but I was yeah. like trying to hide all that. So, right. Yeah. So, but, yeah. so your dad's teaching you how to sing. You're you're sort of working at developing your chops in that regard, mm -hmm. and then at some point you start rapping. I started rapping first. Okay. And when it, when it came to that, it was it was also filling and it was a lot of pockets. I was really into pockets. I wasn't really into the punchlines. It was the pockets. And for those that don't know, which is probably a lot of people listening, when you say pockets, what do you mean? Like riding the beat, like how you so fit into falling the beat. into yeah. areas in within the rhythm between the snare hi hat and the kick drum mm -hmm. in different ways. Yeah, those Turn are the different pockets, right? Yep. Timing, timing, right. Yep. Where you land at with the syllable, where you land at, where it's going right. to fall. Yep. Where the word you rhyme at lands, whether it's on a snare or at the end or the middle, and then where you start the next bar, right? Yeah. Or, all of that. Yeah, it's all these little tricks of trade that you kind of learn, but that's the, right. that's the gist of it. Got you. Yeah, I mean, there's a million ways to do it, right? That's why, you know, that's what, that's what keeps it interesting. Keep it interesting. Pockets are Pockets are more important sometimes because... Some people aren't as like like not they're not as I won't say as good. They're not as technical as a Marshall or a Royce or you know. Yeah. So it's sometimes you like them because of you know how they how they ride the beat. Right, and and you might not even know as a listener unless you're really paying close attention what they're doing. No, right? no. Because sometimes if you listen to a guy like. You know, since we're talking about him, this is his his podcast, essentially. Since you're talk, talking about a guy like Marshall, mm -hmm. he's often even riding like a hi-hat. Yeah. He'll find the the little nuances in a beat and he'll he'll he started off just trying to land on certain snares and be like the other snare. And then I would notice like he would skip sometimes and then it would be rhyming. It was really weird. But his main right. thing is like he'll become. As he got more and more and more and more technical and more advanced, yeah, it's like a hi hat and it's going crazy. <laughs> sure, but it's all very yeah. deliberate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Like the, it's not by accident. He locks that's why into it's good to make beats without a lot of hi hats for him. I see. Okay, I, that's why I like giving him more not crazy hi hats because because he locks into be it and becomes rigid yeah. sometimes. Yeah, it's just that I'm super into because what people don't realize about him is that just as much as he is an incredible writer. His pockets are like he's making these rhythms up when he's going. And it's like that was the one thing that I gravitated towards 
was how he chose what instrument he chose to become. So right. knowing drums and knowing how drums work, I'd be like, you know what? Let me scale it down so that he can, I can see what he's going to do. And I'm always excited about where he's going to choose. Right. You know? All right. So, so we're going to get more into that, obviously, ladies and gentlemen, here on the Paul Pod with Mr. Porter. Uh, Hello. Ha- hi. So we're getting into the area where you guys cross paths, mm-hmm. right? And yeah. this is still before my time and knowing you guys mm-hmm. f- by a few years. But yeah. from, from what I know, you guys met through a gentleman named IQ. IQ. Yeah. Right? IQ, yes. So how did that happen? Well, just to go back even a little bit before that, I knew of him. I just didn't go to school because I got shot at 14. I got shot at 14, and I met him about four or five years later. So So you got shot, and then you stopped going to school? Yeah, I was like, we eighth grade, that was it, after eighth grade. I went to ninth grade. I was moving back to North Carolina. We were supposed to move back. I went there for like half a semester. And my man, my mom was like, we going back. And I was like, no, let's not go back. And yeah, I got well, shot. <laughs> so you got shot and, and yep. obviously survived. I think you, I, I know you might've got hit in the keister. <laughs> what's, what's that? What you mean? The keister? The, the ass. No, 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 no. In your no, arm? I got shot. No, I got shot in my left leg. On your leg. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's why, that's oh, where your deer upper leg, leg came from. Yeah. That deer leg. The deer, deer leg. leg. All right, so not not far from the keister. <laughs> yeah. Okay. No, so I got shot in my left leg. It was, it was across the main artery with a vein. I ended up flatlining three times in the surgery. I was depressed for two years, and I was trying to figure things out. But I had met him. I knew IQ. Right. Because at this time, remember, I was rapping, but mm-hmm. I wasn't taking it serious. Met IQ, and Q really understood my level of talent that I didn't understand. And he was like, "You got to give beats to people." And I was like, "Oh man, it's you know." I'm wait, just wait, 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 wait. Let's 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 address that for a second. Mm-hmm. He understood your level of talent, which you didn't understand. Does I that didn't mean understand. you didn't believe in what you were doing, or you didn't know what you were capable of, or both? I didn't know if that was good or not. I you just didn't, okay. I just loved the loved the, the the aspect of making music. Yeah, like that's understandable. Doing, I mean, you don't yeah. really have an audience yet, and it's just yeah. you sort of doodling around in your bedroom or cheap studios yeah. or whatever, and you don't really have that much feedback, so how do you know how good you are? You right? don't know, right? right? And Q was like, yo, you tripping. And then he he told M about me, and M lived around the corner, and I didn't know that. Right, so how close are we talking? We're talking literally like... 175 steps. <laughs> like, so he was on Dresden already? <laughs> yeah, he was he was he had moved from Dresden by this time, but he lived he had just moved. I don't I, I want to say or he was around the corner on Dresden and I walked by that school by his house Paul almost every day and didn't even know it. When I was So you you're, you're to walking school. to school. Mm-hmm. Right past Marshall's house on Dresden. Yep. Didn't know him. Didn't know him. I mean, can you can you just fathom that for a second? You know, it's even crazier. There's a yeah. guy that stayed on his street that lived across the street, and me and him was best friends. This white guy named Michael Carafelli. <laughs> so another like, white guy on Dresden in Detroit. On Dresden. Dresden was the white people's street, I think. But you're 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 friends with the guy across the street. <laughs> I'm a, I'm friends with the you guy. Know, across you're the not street. friends with Eminem. No, don't even. You're know walking him. past his house, <laughs> completely hanging out with Michael Carafelli, whatever his name is. <laughs> And Michael you don't know Eminem something. yet, but he's no, there. I didn't know. And, and, and now this is before high school. And that's why I had heard about him because Proof brought him to Osborne and he murdered everybody up there. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Now we're getting somewhere. All right. Yeah. So you're walking to school every day, past Marshall's house, going mm-hmm. to Osborne. I'm going to Pulaski. Okay. You're going to Pulaski, but Proof was at Osborne. Yeah. They were already. And, and Marshall wasn't at either of those schools. No. Right. No. And Proof bought him up He there. was at Lincoln? He was at yeah, Lincoln, at, Lincoln at this time. Well, he wasn't there. He was supposed to be at Lincoln. Right. He was supposed to be at Lincoln <laughs> right. for his third try at ninth grade or whatever it was. Yeah. All right. So they were, they were ahead of me. So that's why. They were a year or two older than you, right? Yeah. Yep. yep. So Marshall's hanging out with Proof mm-hmm. and he's going... He's being invited by Proof to go to Osborne, where Proof went to high school, mm. so that he could rap in the lunchroom. 
and right? no Tron. That was where it was going down. And he would set Marshall up and and sort of use him in sort of a white man can't jump kind of way, right? Yeah, like pretty much. I bet you whatever you can't beat the white boy. Yeah, exactly. And <laughs> if they only knew, they had no idea. So and, and he proof, was, he was tearing proof is cleaning apart. up. He's taking everybody's money. Marshall's battling. Cats left and right. I don't even right. know if he was doing it even for money. He was just doing it because you know how crazy proof was. He would just do stuff like just to just to fuck with laugh. people, just yeah, to yeah, mess yeah. with people. Yeah, yeah. Ah, I got you. Yeah, right. Yeah, that was enough for him. That's it. So, yeah. So, so you get invited by who? To to Osborne to see all oh, this shenanigans. No, I was actually supposed to be there. Okay, I was supposed to be going there. By the time he had been doing this for a little bit, but. Let's say when I graduated from eighth grade, what grade was they? Uh, maybe well, they should they have been probably in, in ninth or tenth. Yeah, they was in tenth, tenth or yeah, might might have been tenth or eleventh. But by the time I was going there, I went for like a month. This was before I got shot, mind you. So uh-huh. I knew of him, but I was friends with Proof because Proof lived in the hood. He lived in, um, on on Hoover. I stayed on Row. I stayed on Death Row. He stayed on Hoover, and Vaughn stayed on Runyon. Making so it sound like L.A. Man, listen, it was L.A. before L.A. <laughs> it was like, like I mean, you know how bad it was, but yeah, yeah, yeah. It, so, I, I, of course. So he he they stayed there, and I heard he had came up to Osborne, and I was like, "What do you mean it's a white boy? What are you talking about?" But I mind you, Paul, I didn't remember. I couldn't even. I didn't even recall that because it was you know I got shot and my kind of things like that. So right. by the time IQ tells him about me, I'm doing beats for three months because at this point. I discovered JD, who people know as Dilla. Right. And um, I didn't know Q-Tip. I knew I found out Q-Tip made beats. And I was like, you can make beats and rap? And then I saw Proof make beats and rap. And remember, IQ made beats. Okay. And so... So wait, he, so where, where, where in this equation and in what circumstances do you actually meet Marshall under? He tells M about me, and M shows up at my door. <laughs> IQ tells tells Marshall about you. Yep, and he shows he, up. He finds out that you live around the corner from him, mm-hmm. and he comes <laughs> over to your house. He comes over to the house, knocks on the side door. And says Mom. what? Q told me about you, blah, 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 blah. I think my, we might have talked on the phone. Maybe we talked on the phone, but Q hooked us up. I can't okay. remember how exactly, but I know when he came to the house, my mom was like, you better not be selling no drugs. Oh, <laughs> <'Cause>, man. Because <laughs> in oh, our hood, man. obviously, th- where we at, like, right down the street from my block is the bad block. So M's block and my block was like, you know, it was it was almost like a. I had to cross one street. We had one street in between us. Right. But that next block over from me, bro, it was like the Carter. <laughs> so where so, you were living was... Livable, residential, okay. Yeah, Marshall's right block to, was yeah. livable, residential, okay. Yeah. Still yeah. smack in the middle of the hood. Smack, but there really. was a street in between that was really bad. Yeah, like it was New Jack block. City. It was New Jack City. The block Which street? Next up for me. It, that was on a row. Row was, was New block. Jack City. Okay. You know how it is. Like when you know how it is there. It's like you're you got that long street that go from eight mile to seven mile, but there's the blocks. Boom, boom, boom. Yeah. So the next block up. Terrible. And so that's why my mom thought what's going on. So what's M the main the street in between seven and eight mile that's like seven and a half mile? State Fair. Okay. Right. Yeah, because M was So M you right guys were on the fair. south side of State Fair, right? No, we were on the north side of State Fair. Closer to eight mile. Closer to eight mile. But okay. M was literally right at State Fair. His block and State Fair is right there. Got it. All I'm right. on I, two blocks. I know. From that. I know the geography a little bit. I was on yeah. 13 mile, but I, I know the geography a little bit. <laughs> you, you was, you was out the way in the good space. I was like, all right, yeah. you have, you, that's good. We didn't have, we didn't have New Jack City. We had nah. uh, Burger King. You. Meet Marshall either on the phone or in person. He says, "Yo, IQ told me we should get up." Yeah, because he heard you made beats. Yep, and and he wanted beats. He wanted beats because he didn't have beats at this time. Right, and I was like, "Okay, cool." So the first thing I played him was Backstabber. 
But wait a second. How did you know that he could rap? You just took his word for it? Nah, he played me Backstabber the original. Okay. And when I heard that, he was like, yo, I want to do another version to this. I need another version of this song. Okay, yeah. got you. So you heard that and you were like, okay, he can rap. Mm -hmm. Did you think he was great or okay or good or? So here's where, here's where creatively I got him. Okay. We both big Tretch fans. Yes. And I said, yo, if you slow down a little bit, <laughs> people would be able to understand you. Yeah, I got in trouble for that on, on the last podcast. What, 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 what? <laughs> apparently, apparently there's one one point where I told him to let off the gas a little bit. And he told mm -hmm. he the way he related to Rick made it sound different. And okay. Rick was like, is he crazy? <laughs> he was like, what are you saying? Like, calm it down. Don't be so good. I think he meant like, don't don't push yourself so hard. Like, let off the gas. And I was just no, saying, yeah. literally, don't go so fast with your. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With, with, yeah. Make the words so dense. And, and that's, that's kind of what you're saying. That's what I was telling. It was like, right. yo, if you slow down and people actually get, because I understood what he was saying, because li I'm listening to it like I listen to Tretch. And I was like, yo, if we kind of slow this down and we did Backstabber. And when he did it, his delivery, I mean, I was like, yo, this is not normal. Right. And he was seriously evolving at this point into not even what he became and the world knows him as, but into no. the... Eminem of the Infinite period. Yes. Right? This was the first song before we did Infinite, yep. Right. Okay. Yep. Which ended up, did it end up on Infinite? No, we didn't put it on Infinite, I don't think. But Backstabber? That was the first, yeah, I don't think Backstabber was on Infinite. I was think it? it may have been. But yeah, that version, Yeah, well, that was the first song we ever did. And my first thing, was my first mind was like, yo, I knew what he was saying. I could hear how he was connecting everything. Then I had never really heard nobody like connect like that besides Tretch. And he was doing it better than Tretch was at the time to me. And I was like, this is incredible. This is what I want to do. And mind you, I'm only doing beats three months. Yeah. Backstabbers on infinite. Yeah. I was so, right. So, so at this point he sparks. Now I'm like, yo, we got it. Let's just keep going. Okay. And where yeah. are you guys recording at this point? We were recording everywhere from Mo Master Studios, which is a very, very popular studio in that time. Right. Mo Master, you pay by the hour to record pay there, by right? by the hour. Right. So we had to have a song together, work on it, all of that. And then where else were we recording? Oh, Dia Day Studios. Remember Dia Days? Mm -hmm. And then we started recording at Mark and Jeff Bass spot on 8 Mile. And that's when we You guys recorded. were really in the thick of making Infinite. We was making Infinite at this point. And did that project start with an intent of making an album called Infinite? Or was it like you started working with them and just kept working with them and it evolved into a project? I think Infinite, by the time we got to that song, I might even gave him, I might even gave him that beat. You know, the, the maybe I gave him that beat first or it was the like beat the beat for Infinite, the song? Yeah. And I remember, like, we gravitated towards that one so much. And and I don't know. Mind you, you can tell the influence. My influence was from Tribe. So it was kind of like we were trying to, you know, AZ and Nas was it at the time. Yeah, they were, they were like the really popular rappers. And you can yeah. hear a lot of that influence in the way Marshall rapped on that project, for sure. Yeah. So we were trying to, we were just trying to get a song on, on 98. That was the goal. <laughs> So the local radio station, WJLB, yeah. which was the, the urban FM station, you guys thought that maybe you could make something to make it on the air there. We just wanted to make it on the air. We, we, we went so far as doing commercials. Bushman got like two or three commercials out of us. We was just happy to be on, on, the, on the show. Like, remember, he sure. would play the little songs before he'd start his show. And we had this one song, Bushman's back in the mix again. Bushman's back in the mix from six to ten. And it was like even doing that. Right. <laughs> just like, hearing yourself on the radio was like a just huge was deal. Amazing. Right. But and, what you yeah. guys didn't realize, and, and it becomes more and more so over the years, is that this is corporate radio. Yeah. Right. So and we don't understand the workings of no, it. No, we're like, kids and we're like, well, why well, how no. come they don't play more Detroit rap on the radio station here? Yeah. And we don't really understand the way that radio worked back then. Exactly. Even more exactly. so probably than now, but 
it's complicated. Yeah, they even have more control back then than they do now because then they yeah. could pick some stuff yeah. that they could play. Yep. Now the the even a lot of the mix shows they're told, okay, this here's a list of records that you you can play. They end up playing some of the songs. So JLB played some of the stuff from Infinite, and Infinite was released independently. You mm-hmm. produced how many of the records on that album? All of them, except for Jealousy. So that's 12 records, 11 records. Yeah, this is You me, produced three 10, 10 out of the 11 <laughs> records. Yeah. I mean, that's great. That's like starting off, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that's, just, that's your first project that you ever locked into, right? Man, first time. And that was like my guy. Like, I'm like, this was it. This was like... I felt like I belonged in a place. Because, right. you know, before then, you know, you would go through crews, you would have your crews. But at that time, the guys, you know, man, like it was very hard to get people to stay serious about it. You know, you got to spend all your money to the studio. Yeah. Well, not only do you have to you spend know? your money, but there was no money coming in. Yeah. So unless you really, really wanted to do it. Yeah. You had to give it to it. Yeah. You, why else would you do it? Yep. But, but let's make something clear. Not only was there not money coming in, you're spending your own money to make the records and to get studio time, mm-hmm. but you guys are working also. Right? Yeah, very, very much so. <laughs> so let's talk about that for a second, yeah. because there's some legendary stories about oh, that, yeah. those times. Where were you guys working? Uh, Gilbert's. Gilbert's Lodge in St. Clair Shore. But before that, there was something else, right? Well, they worked at Little Caesars. Okay. Him and Proof but worked at Little Caesars. You didn't work Little at Little Caesars? Caesars? No, I didn't work at Little Caesars. Okay, so so Proof and Marshall worked at Little Caesars, mm-hmm. making pizzas, yep. or pizza pizzas, yep, and crazy bread. It, man. <laughs> hot and ready, and, baby. Hot yeah. and ready. Well, they weren't hot and ready back <laughs> they, then. but They weren't but hot and ready then. It was the pizza pizza that came in like, it was on the cardboard, and it had the paper sleeve that was like stapled shut, right? And it, and it, and it tastes like paper, but that's all we had. No, it, it was good, man. I, lo- I yeah, loved it. I mean, so, on. so, so you move over to Gilbert's, yeah, right, and still making pizza, mm-hmm. pretty much. But what were you guys doing there? Marshall was a short order cook, right? Yeah, he was the, but he was the main cook. I was running, I was running the fryer, the the yeah, the fryers. So I was dropping mozz sticks hot left and right, like mozzarella sticks and. Fried mushrooms and all of that stuff. French fries and yeah, I was whatever was fried, chicken wings. Yep, pretty much. Got so you. then I would do. Sometimes I would run. I would be like secondhand, but man, he was quick. So I was like, let me get back on this fryer, and because <laughs> you know it's like he moving, moving, moving. You know when he do something, he locked into it. So you could tell at that point he, his OCD was like really kicking in. And did you guys intend to work there together? Was that like a thought? No, I think, you know, I needed a job because I wasn't, I was staying with my parents. But at this point, I know that this, this is what I want to do. So I'm focusing a lot on music. My dad really didn't want me to get in music. And we, we weren't seeing eye to eye at that time. And then um, M was like, yo, I can get you a job here. And I was like, cool. So were you guys both still living at home at this point? No, I was living, we were living uh, on Navarra. We lived in Detroit on Navarra, not far from Eastland. That's on the east side of Detroit. So you guys had a house together. Yeah, me, him, and James, you, him, and, and, a, and a few other guys, right? Yeah, yep. Yeah. And he's working at Gilbert's. Mm-hmm. Living in a house with Marshall. Yep. And here's the crazy part about that. Let me make this point. Let me I'm tell you I'm not going to get I, into the Taurus. Yeah, no, 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 no. The, the, let me tell you, this is the most important, one of the most important things. I knew he was a lot more like me the way that he handled that. I didn't, he didn't have money to give me for beats. I couldn't stay in my house if I didn't have a job. So he was like, yo, you don't really got a place to stay. I'll give you the room. I'm going to sleep on the couch. Whoa. So he gave up his room so that you could focus on being an artist and then helped you get a job at Gilbert's. Yep. So that you can make ends meet. He knew I was good enough to like, you know, it was like we had a we had a connection at this point. Like we we had a we had a a, a synergy like that that worked. And I was like, "All right, look, I'm going to get better at beats." I'm uh, and I needed a place to make beats. I was making beats in the room at the crib and he gave me the room. Wow. 
and he slept on the couch. And I was like, you know what? There's no way that I'm ever, this became like my closest friend. Yeah, well, listen, if that's not the definition of a friend, I don't know what is. Yeah. And so at that point, I knew it was somebody that had the same passion for it and everything. And I learned so much because he even taught me, he taught me how to be a better rapper too. So, and she, I, I taught him stuff about beats while we was there. So he had an understanding even before he met Dre of how to actually put it together. He knew what he wanted to hear. You know? Wow. So, That's deep. Uh, so yeah. at what point do you guys start to realize maybe this is going to actually work? Because Infinite comes out, yeah. like you said, it got a little bit of like attention maybe from local radio, but nothing serious. Yeah. It's really sold very independently to the point where, now this is where I come into the picture. Mm-hmm. Marshall, I had introduced, been introduced to Marshall through Proof, right? Mm-hmm. Proof was managing the hip-hop shop. Mm-hmm. I was in law school yep. at University of Detroit. And mm-hmm. every Saturday would be open mic at the hip-hop shop. Yep. And I always had a dream that when I became a lawyer and started practicing music law, I was going to grab a bunch of my favorite rappers and producers from Detroit mm-hmm. and represent them as their lawyer. Right. Yeah. That was my, my idea. That's what I thought I was going to do. Yeah. So I would go to the hip hop shop as a fan, but also to see what was developing within the scene. Mm-hmm. So one day proof pulls me aside and he says, Hey, I want you to stay after the battles are done today. And I want, I got somebody I want you to meet. And I said, all right you know, proof was always up to something. Mm -hmm. And I was like, who is it? And he just gives me this look and he's like, it's a white boy. (laughs) Right. (laughs) So, so I was like, Oh, okay. You want the white guy to see the white guy rap. All right, fine. I'll stay. So I stay after. And this guy walks in with, you know, really short shaved head, not Mm -hmm. bald like mine, but you know, a number one clipper, number one boy. Yeah. <laughs> Wearing a uh, white sweatsuit head to toe. Mm-hmm. Looking a little bummy. Mm-hmm. And Proof cleared everybody out except me and like DJ Head and a couple other people. Mm-hmm. And he had him rap. So that's how I met Marshall. And two weeks later, or three weeks later, something like that, I'm at the shop again and Marshall pops in again maybe wearing the same sweatsuit Mm -hmm. and he's selling infinite hand to hand. I was there that day on cassette. Yep. And I bought it from him for $6. Yes. And that, that was the beginning of it. Right. So I don't know if you remember the first time I met you. I, I don't, but tell me, it was that maybe I will. At St. Andrews. Okay. You had a girl with you. Uh Uh-oh. Yep. She has short hair. Okay. I remember this chick and I was like, yo, this dude, like, he like the thing. Cause like, he got this badass chick with him. He's like, <laughs> come in, he was lawyer. And so everybody like was excited. And, and then let me tell you how much of a kid I am. I'm like, everybody excited to meet you and they I'm see you cause they know you. And I'm like, yo. And I like put my hands out and I hug you and I hit the girl. You hit her? Like yes. Joking like around. My, my hand hit her. You don't oh, even remember. by accident. <laughs> yeah, by accident. I know. I, like, I think I know who you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, and this was at St. Andrews. And I was like, but I had heard about you already because you had already met him. So I was, I looked like I was a baller. You like, you was balling. Yes. Because you like the lawyer. All yes. I knew was lawyer, bro. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> had, I, had I known, but then they told me you rapped and all that stuff. I was like, what? I had, I had lawyers used can't yeah, rap. I used <laughs> like, to rap. Yeah. No, lawyers lawyers can't rap. It, yeah, it, ter- like, it turns out it turns out they can't. <laughs> and I was like, okay, wait a minute. No, no, that's, you know, that's downplaying because y'all, you know, you can rap. You just, so I met you know. so I met you with with my current situation, <laughs> and yep. you introduced yourself. I introduced myself like I knew you. And, and how how much prior to that was when I saw you again and bought the cassette from Marshall? Within a few <sighs> months, or that was it was not that long after. It right. was not that long after, yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. That's funny. Yeah. All right. So then what we all know 
or should know, and anybody's listened this far probably knows, mm-hmm. is it's not like the Infinite album blew up. No. Right? It was definitely, it was one of those things where people in the hood knew about it, and they was like, yo, this white boy is ill. It was so his people, first swing at the plate. That's it. Yep. So I moved to New York after that because I graduated law school in 96. Yeah. And Infinite had come out in 95, right? It came out at the end of 95, 96 because I right. remember saying that. Yeah, yeah we I think I bought it at the end of 95. Yep. And then 96, I graduated law school, moved to New York, take the bar. Mm-hmm. But I stayed in touch with everybody from from Detroit. Yeah. So then, you guys continue working together. Mm-hmm. And where do you wh- wh- where does where do things go? Tell me your recollection. Well, we ended up trying to push that as much as we could. We went to Freaknik. We went to we drove to Freaknik. And so you guys to drove down to Freaknik to pass out tapes. Pass out. But was that infinite? That was infinite. Okay. And we was pushing that for a while, and then M just got frustrated. And I want to say, Haley, no, it was Lena was born. And I remember him just being, because because right after Lena was born, Haley, he got Kim got pregnant with Haley. Yeah, and he was like, so Yo. his back was against the wall. Yeah, it was like that's when it got real. And we moved from um, Fairport is not far from Navarre. It's a city. It's a little. It's a street in Detroit that's close. To, it's right off Seven Mile. Literally, still smashing. So you guys moved into the next house with each other. We moved into the next house, and now he's he's a dad. Right. So it's like so so stuff is getting very real. It's real real. And he's and, feeling his backs against the wall. Yeah, and like I'm I'm like come on I'm I'm staying at this place with him. And Kim and they like, look, I'm like the the extra guy at the place. I'm not paying anything. I'm just making beats. And Kim, uncle, your like, uncle Nani. Yeah, and I'm like sitting there. <laughs> Kim probably was like, he got to get out of here. I'm like, I'm a, you know, it's right. nothing. But we, but at this point, he we start dabbling in more of. He start growing into Slim Shady. <laughs> guys decide or proof decides yeah that you guys are going to come together yep and form a super group yep called the dirty dozen the dirty dozen and you're based the idea kind of like the woo gambinos Mm -hmm. you guys are going to all have different aliases for your regular names yeah because we are solo artists but we got to have an alias to be in the group. Got it. Yep. And he took a whole bunch of people and people, it was 12 people at first. It so Dirty Dozen people. was literally a dozen rappers. It was a dozen rappers at first. Right. Yeah. And, and it, yeah. it at some point whittled down to six later on, each mm-hmm. having an alter ego, which still made it a dozen. Yep. And Marshall chooses his alias. And Slim Shady is born. Slim Shady is born. Yeah. So he comes up with this character Mm -hmm. and decides this is an opportunity for me to do stuff that I don't feel comfortable doing in my regular persona. Not even that he don't feel comfortable doing it was kind of like, I'm tired of this shit. Like everything that he was actually going through, it was like he took off all of the forget radio, forget everything. This is like, What I'm feeling, everybody got to feel. Right. And everything had to fit that. So when when the idea came about, everything had to change, the way that the music sound and everything. So I was going for a more filth, 
was the thing. Cause remember we we do some shit and be like, ew. Yeah, you know? dirty, dirty dozen. Dirty dozen is filth. So so the the music had to be that way. And he was literally, bro. Oh man, what song was it? Bring your boys in. We could bring the noise in. You don't want to fuck with Dirty Dozen. Right. Zar did the hook. And M's verse, like, he was born at this point. He found who he was supposed to be. He found who he was supposed to be. He wasn't trying to be anybody else anymore. Nope. Nope. He was being himself, saying the stuff that he wanted to say Mm -hmm. with real purpose behind it. It was really fun because he didn't... You could tell it was no hoes bar, and you could you could hear the frustration of being a dad and having to pay bills and shit like that. It was like all in there. Yeah, you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. So so you start making those records, and he at the same time starts making some more demos for himself as well. Yeah, but before that, check this out. Remember, beats rhymes in life. Tribe Called Quest beats rhymes in life. Yeah, drifting by. Sword and lead that song. Yeah. He had the illest song to that beat. M had that beat before Tribe them had it. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hold yes. on a second. <laughs> stop, yes. stop right there. Yes, bro. So you're saying, because this has been an ongoing discussion for a very long time mm-hmm. about Marshall never really properly working with Dilla. Yeah, he had that beat. So you're saying Marshall had that Dilla beat. He had that beat. Before... Q-Tip did. Before Tribe had it. It was on the tape. He How did it. he have it? From Proof? Proof gave it to him. He was like, yo, I got to get some Dilla beats. We was so he wasn't in the studio Dilla. with Dilla? No, 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 no. He got he the beat it. from Proof. He got the beat from Proof. Did he make a song to it? He got a whole song. I don't even know if he recorded it, but he wrote it because I remember him writing it. And I oh, remember wow. the song being ill as hell because it was, I forget what the concept was, but you know, back then we would do the verse like, you know, we could do the verse out loud because we couldn't record it right away. Right. And he told Proof and told Dilla, like told JD, he was like, yo, M want this beat. And it might have been another beat too. But that song, so when we heard it on the on the Tribe album, it was like, oh, man. <laughs> you know, but it's Tribe Called Quest. What you going to say? So did you know before you heard the song? What you mean? That, that it was... Used for an album? No, because it was when he made it. So when it came out, you heard that? We heard, yeah, when we when it came out, that's when we found out it was on there. Because we didn't know, you know, Proof knew JD, but JD also was popping at this time, but JD also knew that he wanted to beat because he was going to give it to him. He just was like, he told him a price, and I think M was trying to get the money up for it or something because he was broke, you know? Yeah, sure. But then he was working on with Tribe, and this was right when they first started working together, and that's when you know it came out and stuff. So, wow, yeah, I was like ill. But now, mind you, they would have got Slim Marshall. They wouldn't have got. They would have got. That would have been the first version of I am Marston, Marshall Mathers, Slim Shady over a Dilla beat. They, they would have got that. So you're saying this is like before? Just don't give a fuck. This was before Just Don't Give a Fuck. But this was, he was already this person. Because mind right. you, we had practiced for a whole year of just working on D12 stuff. It wasn't, and this was the first solo song, one of the first solo songs he was working on for his next project, which would have been the Slim Shady EP, or uh, yeah, EP, because we was working on Dirty Dozen shit, so. Wow. Yep. Do you remember what the song was called? I don't know, but man, the concept he had to it was crazy because it was like, you know, it was the M that we know, the way his brain works. You know what I'm saying? It was like, I just remember it being a dope concept. And this, I remember, I want to say he said the verse, he spit the verse one time because he was playing the beat because I remember him playing that beat over and over again. And I was so happy that it was. Is like that a the JD song? Beat. Was it called "Get a Hold"? Yep, get a hold. So unfortunately, that record never happens. Nope. You know, whatever it was meant to be, it was a great Tribe Called Quest song. Yeah. But you guys keep working. He starts working on records in his new persona. Mm-hmm. And we working Some on point, D12 stuff. Yep. You working on D12 stuff. Some point you realize that 
he's going to put an EP together. Well, no, this is what happened. After the D12 stuff, remember, we kind of dismantled, dis- disbanded at that version of it. And yeah. I think at that time, him and Proof was like, you know, they was mad at each other, but they best friends. So, you know, they done. And he, M is frustrated now. Still. And he, yeah. He was what, already what, frustrated. He, he said he's yeah, more but frustrated. Now it's like rock bottom. It's like we lost a, had to move from Fairport because it's like, you know, he a dad. He got to move. I go back home. And he's a dad. And he was like, I remember. He came to my house, back to my mom's house. This, this is crazy because my house on road, this is just, this is why it's a magical thing to me because he came back. He said, yo, I need some beats. I'm working on this. This is my last shot. Fuck it. And I'm like, man, if I don't get money for beats right now, my parents going to kick me out again. So I don't give a damn if it's $20. He was like, I ain't got no money, but I got a radio. I said, cool, because I ain't got no I ain't got no radio to make beats on. <laughs> so he gave me the radio that he had, right? Yeah. And we both was like at our wits end because I got to go get a job now because they didn't even want me doing it. They gave me a shot at like I moved. We It didn't work. We put that on it didn't work. So he's at his wits end. I'm at my wits end. And he was like, I don't got no money, but I got a radio. Cool. I make beats on this radio that he gave me. And the first beat that I made was... Low down and dirty. So you're making beats on a radio, meaning you're using like an amplifier that he had? That's how I would have to plug into the radio through the RCA cable. Right. So it's an amplifier so that you can hook something up to the speakers to to play the music through. Yeah. Okay. So... And that was what what he gave you. I'm making... You know, we red man fans, we all yeah. of these things, but and I had a, got, the red man sample for the chorus. And the red man sample is in there. And so that was the first thing. And I was like, this is it. We're going to work on. I did that. And then I did just don't give a fuck. And that, that was once that song happened, it was like Slim Shady EP. That, Slim Shady that EP. was the moment the lightning really struck. That's when it really set in. So that's where I come in the picture, mm-hmm. right? Because yeah. I'm in New York. Yeah. And we did everything working we could Working at do. nine <laughs> to five as a lawyer. Yeah. Had passed the bar because I'm a genius. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I get a phone call from DJ Head. And he says, listen, you got to check out the new stuff Eminem's doing. Yeah. And obviously I knew who he was. Mm-hmm. I had bought Infinite, mm-hmm. was a fan, mm-hmm. but, you know, he wasn't Eminem yet, right? Yeah, it wasn't Eminem yet. So I said, great, how do I get in touch with him? Man, I'm going to have him call you. Either he had him call me or I called him, and I don't even know if I had a cell phone yet, right? This is 97. Yeah, yeah. So somehow we get on the phone with each other, and I... I was like, hey, remember me? He's like, yeah, cool. I said, hey, I really heard you got some new stuff that, that's incredible. I want to check it out. All right, I'll send it to you. Sends me a cassette, right? And that cassette mm-hmm. had Low Down Dirty. Mm-hmm. It had Just Don't Give a Fuck. Mm-hmm. It had, I think, No One's Iller. Mm-hmm. And I think it had the song Slim Shady. You remember that song? Wow, yeah, that's, I, did that, I did that song too. Right. 97 Burgundy Blazer, wanted for burglary, had to dish the Mercury Tracer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So that was like the that was that birth of that sound. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh my God, I forgot about that one. So that that obviously made me very excited. Mm-hmm. Right? Because these are records now. People might not know that form that I got them in, but people know a form that was released. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So especially with just don't give a fuck. Even yeah. though that beat changed and it wasn't the beat that it was originally, but whatever. So yeah. heartbreaking. Yeah, I, I felt I felt <laughs> that. But anyway, um, serious demoitis with that record. I mean, I, I was just listening to I mean, it nonstop. Listen, yeah. So yeah. so so I get this thing. I flip out. I call him back up, and I'm like, "Yo, I am a lawyer now. I'm in New York. I want to represent you officially. Great." 
What are we going to do? I mm-hmm. don't know. I'm going to start working it. I'm going to shop your music and we'll figure it out. Mm-hmm. He was signed to the Bass Brothers, of course. You know, along with them, he had decided to create the Slim Shady EP, which is what these demos became, right? Yeah. And you produced a bunch of that stuff. Mm-hmm. And everybody sort of knows the story from there, right? He goes out to the Rap Olympics, gets on the radio. Dr. Dre hears him, doesn't know who he is. I get the demos. Marshall and I get the demos to Interscope. Jimmy Iovine gives the demo to Dre. Dre mm-hmm. hears it, says, that's the kid I heard on the radio. Yeah. Bring him in here. So we just skipped over about, you know, a year of work. But yeah, for yeah. the sake of this being a podcast which feels like to us at the time 10 years like 10 years yeah because when people tell us like you could think like we what were we bro we've been like this since we was what 20s <laughs> it's like it's like maybe a little later than it's been like that for a minute and for us it felt like a long time because it was a lot of you know no the struggle moves, moves slow moves yeah the struggle yeah. moves slow and then when things start to really roll it all moves so fast. Super. Right? And nobody knows what to do. No. No. Because you know? the next 20 years go by like it happened in five years. Man. So you guys kept working with each other. And yeah. Marshall... Forms Shady Records, mm-hmm. signs D12 to Shady Records, yep. and it becomes the sort of honed down version of the group with six members. Yeah. Tell us about that. Six members, Bugs was in the group at the time, and then Bugs get killed at Bell Isle. Bugs die at Bell Isle, trying to break up a fight. Guy shoots him, and that was like right at the pinnacle of everything happening, obviously. And, and then M comes to Detroit to do a show because he's everywhere now. Right. He, he was probably spending a bunch of time in L.A. recording yeah, his album. he's spending all the time in L.A. Right. And I remember, man, I remember having a conversation with him like before we even did the D12 thing because I got a offer at Rough House. Remember Rough House? Sure. Yeah, Rough House is where... Cypress Hill and and the Fugees and yeah. a lot of that great early stuff came out. So for People Get Fucked Up, I had that song and another song that was a just a brigade song, me and Canava. And I remember going to New York. I knew it was happening and it was happening fast because I remember talking to him. This was the last time I had a house phone at that. You know, he used to charge us up the wazoo for, for a house phone. So he yeah, you mean like calls. making long distance calls? <laughs> yeah, long distance calls. Like that whole racket? Like it costs Man. more because you live further away? Yeah, it's like, so I remember talking to him. This is kind of the last time I got to talk to him while he was out there. And I said, bro, don't worry. Because everybody, it was like, I remember him feeling like people was just latching on to him that probably didn't, shouldn't have been, you know? And it was a lot happening. And I remember telling him, like, man, I'm going to see you out there because this is what we're supposed to be doing. And I didn't feel the need to crowd my friend with a bunch of, you know what I'm saying? Like the whole, oh, I got to be, you know, I'm we crew, we this, this, like, like we was going to be crew either way. It's like sure. family at that point. And I so just he, did he did like he that. tell you not to sign somewhere else? Wait until no, I get my he didn't, situation. You didn't have to tell me. It was just my it was my choice. Okay. It was my choice. Because I knew that I could do it because I had already learned enough. And if if he got to where he was going that way, listen, I was producing the shit. So why would I worry about it? I just had to keep working. And that was always my mentality. And I think that's what made him and me continue to be able to be friends is never about business. That that's not that's not how we handle each other, you know. And this is a choice to make to be a part of where you could start it. And I kind of had that offer on the table. I think Bizarre even had some offer and proof too. So we had, we all kind of had to make. You know, it was a good thing to just come together and do it because it was stronger that way, you know. Sure. But I remember hey. having it and I thought, all right, this is it. 
You know what I mean? I knew what to do. I knew how to take it and how, how to handle it and how I'm suppo how, how supposed to approach it because I learned from him. I was with him the whole time. So, And he was always like a big brother. I mean, when I bought my first car, he said, all right, now you got to come and show, show up to work. You got to come to work on time. <laughs> Yeah. He was like, now nah, you got to pay for it. Yeah, you have no excuse now. I have no excuse now. Because you have so wheels. He was he was always like that with me, so I needed that. So when 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 Bugs passed away, mm -hmm. I'm sure there was a moment of pause. Yeah. And then you guys decide to bring somebody else in the group. Yeah, Swift. Okay. And that was, uh, I think Bugs wanted us to bring Swift before he passed. Okay. And that's how that happened. And you so, were in you were in a group with Caniva. Yeah. Yep. Me and we were called the Brigade. The Brigade. And, yep. Right. So there was always like that's what a lot of people don't understand. There was always like synergy and side projects and other things happening. Proof had three or four different groups he was a part of, right? You yeah. had the Brigade, plus your work with D twelve, plus your production mm -hmm. work, plus your solo work. Yeah. Swift was in a group called the Rabies. Bazaar was in D12 and mm -hmm. had his thing going. Had his thing as like a quasi member of the Outsiders at one point. Yeah, quasi. Yep. Sure and was. and that that whole thing was was great because everybody was so creative. But you know, Marshall and I formed this label and we we had a real home mm -hmm. for you guys. So yeah. you you guys make the debut album for D12 Devil's Night, mm -hmm. and you produced a bunch of stuff on there and. As you're moving on, at some point, you meet Dr. Dre. And I know yeah. this was pivotal for you because you learned so much from him. Yeah. T I met tell him me actually about that. Way, I met him actually earlier. But before Marshall Mathers LP, I met him like Slim Shady, he, Slim Shady LP right after, I think, a party in New York. So you met him in New York. I met him in New York. With Marshall, probably. With Marshall. Yeah. So right. I met him back then. And remember, I was giving him well, I was giving him beats before. So right when we was working on the Devil's Night album, there was an intro. You don't even know this. Not an intro, but the radio skit. Before for, Bugs. For before Devil's Bugs. Night? Yep, on Devil's Night. Okay. The skit, the, that beat that's there, there's a chop of, there's a chop that's on there. Okay. Okay. <laughs> there's this beat. And that was one thing that I do really well was really chop up shit a certain kind of way. Right. So Dre heard that beat, and there's a song with Snoop and Dre on that beat. It's on the Devil's Night album. There's a whole song of Snoop and Dre over this beat. Because I was giving Dre music, and Dre was already rocking with me. Where Where's this song? Dre got it. I was working with Dre already at this point. So Dre has a song over a beat that we ended up using as background music for a D12 radio skit. Yep, yep. It's a skit that I made for yep for right before the Bugs thing. Do we know what it's called? <laughs> nah, but him and Snoop rapping on it is hard. Oh too. my god, <laughs> it's hard. It's hard. we gotta get our hands on that. Yeah, I had like a gang of shit that they did like because at this time Detox was a thing. This is yeah. When so this is around the time they're 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 making music for. The 2001 album. Yeah, so it was like right after, right on. And he heard that music and was like, yo, we got to work. So I kind of was learning at that point from him. I met him, so I knew him. I had a relationship with him just to, 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 to production. Right. So yeah. And he came to Detroit to work on D12 World. Yes. We worked at Vanguard Studios, which is a monumental yep. Which spot. is where, how we met Mike Strange. Yep, yep. Yeah. So I remember that. And he was there for a couple weeks working yeah. in that studio with you guys, which was, you know, awesome. It made, you know, the songs that ended up being on the D12 album that he produced. Yeah. That's a crazy, crazy time. Yeah. So so the D12 album comes out, obviously does incredibly well. You produced a bunch of records on there. Dre produced a bunch of records on there. Marshall's well, it was pretty just pretty much me, Marshall, and Dre. Yeah. On the production. That's right. Mm -hmm. And Marshall's just on fire. Right, as a solo yeah. artist. The right. D12 album does incredibly well. Yeah. And at some point, we signed 50. Yes. Which we were telling, the craziest part is, so right around the time when M is popping, I remember Power of the Dollar. Yeah. 
We was playing that. We was bumping that, bumping that, bumping at it. And really couldn't zone into it because he was popping himself. Yeah. And it was like, yo, this dude. And then you guys, I think you yeah. reintroduced him to, to, the, to, the, to, to what 50 was doing because the mixtape right. shit started going crazy. So, so after Power of the Dollar and he, he got shot, yeah. he came back later with Guess Who's Back. Yeah. So Guess Who's Back was the new 50 set. The new 50. Right? Yeah. He had his, his draw from being shot. Yep. He really didn't give a fuck at that point. No. So and so 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 much like what we know of as M, where it's like this balls to the wind. Found you know his I mean? voice. Yeah. Found, found his voice. And Marshall finally, for whatever reason, decides to focus on it. Mm-hmm. And he's, oh my God, this is incredible. Yeah. We gotta sign this guy. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, but we're gonna need help. Yeah, right. We gotta, we gotta bring the. We, we're gonna need some help with this one. We gotta yeah, bring right. this. We gotta bring Dre in the fold. Mm-hmm. So we bring it to Dre, sign it, and you know everybody knows that story too. Mm-hmm. What? Tell us about the records that you did with him, just briefly. So, just, just yeah, rattle yeah. them so, off. So basically, PIMP Stunt One Hundred and One. I think I did some shit for G Unit. I did Young Buck. Yeah. So we did a lot of records. So PIMP um, was a major hit. That took it over. That record comes out and it goes like diamond. Now we die. You know what I mean? It was just, yeah. it was unbelievable. So, and, and then you start re- producing for other people and spreading your wings a little bit. Still yeah. staying in D12, still being around, still being connected. But yeah. at the same time, it was like, hey, I have my own career, right? And you didn't yeah. just have to be the guy that was producing for Marshall and was in D12. It was like, I'm Mr. Porter. Mm-hmm. I'm going to go do what I'm going to do. Yeah. And rightfully yeah. so. Yeah. Right? Well, it was, it was definitely a... Definitely, a, I had to grow up kind of thing because, like, remember, I started off as, like, that was just my 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 crew was everything. Right. And so then when Dre came in, it was like, yo, I got to take a backseat to this because I got to learn. So then Dre comes in. And, and for me personally, it was kind of like a bittersweet thing because I was like, man, I'm not landing the records the way that I want to. I want... You know, I'm like, so I'm trying to get better and better. And it was a proving ground to me. So things like all of the stuff that I was doing, I was doing still with the intent of my music family, you guys, everybody, like just trying to impress my crew. You right. get what I mean? So it was like, because you know how we would be out and we would hear records and be like, yo, we still hip hop fans. Of, like we in it, but we still are fans. That's the thing about it. Like we just have this level of, love for the music so i was always yeah. trying to do that so it was a, it was a crazy time just producing them records producing yeah them. and and you guys reconnect make the d12 world album yeah right, which is a second d12 album yeah because i was moved i moved that by that time i was actually living in california so i had to come back home to do that record right yeah right because you had, you know, blossomed and developed your own career. Yeah. So, so, yeah. And, and at the same time, you're still, you know, obviously in touch with Marshall. You guys are on yeah. tour together. Every time he goes out, he brings D12 with him. Mm-hmm. And you guys are still staying close. But at some point, you know, we get to a really difficult time. Yeah. And proof was taken from us. Yes. So yeah. that, for more, more or less... Was the end of D12. Pretty much for me. Well, it, it, not just in a in a metaphysical sense, but in a practical mm-hmm. sense. Yeah, right? it, felt, it felt like nothing else we could do. He was, he was the leader. He had put the group together. Mm-hmm. He was the glue that held it together. He was the guy who, he was the politician. Yeah. He was the one who would resolve arguments. He yep. was the one who could, you know, make you guys cut it out when you were being petty. Yeah. Um, or well, immature or whatever. Would, him would, we would literally fight. Right. We would, no, I know. Like, I know. Yeah, me and him would fight. Like, but, I, but I'll tell you this. That was early on. So as I learned the business more, it became, that's where I learned so much more. 
And I think I had matured a lot quicker because remember, I had to go out and be this other thing. So right. with him doing that and him passing, it was almost like, you know, and the world made it like Eminem's friend died. But it was more than that. You know, we lost so much already. And then when, with, with that, it was just, it was even greater. So it was like we lost the biggest part of the system, even right. the shady system, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, so so with his passing, it was, you know, the, the leader of the group is gone. Mm-hmm. And there was attempts to, I don't want to make this about, you know, that, that much, um, mm-hmm. but there was attempts to sort of put the pieces back together. Yeah. There was, there was a brief attempt at bringing somebody else into the group. Mm-hmm. None of it really worked. Yeah. And the reason is because without proof, it doesn't yeah. work. Yeah. It don't work. Yeah. That was tough. It just, it, you know what? We had the Wu-Tang model, but it was very different because it was, I don't know the extent of their model. I just know from what we saw. But for us, it was like, it's like Voltron not having a head. It's like, you know what I'm saying? It's like, yeah. it just it just was different and it felt more like a, a brother in a way where it was not necessarily a group member. Right. You know? Yeah. So, I yeah, understand. I, I mean, I was there and, and, and believe me, I understand. Yeah. I think that that this is a good time to move ahead a little bit. You continue working with Marshall and after he gets sober, yeah. right? He goes and creates the Relapse album. Yes. Right? Yeah. And you had some work on that project. Yeah. What do you remember about piecing that record together? When Relapse was being done, it was like my mind at this point was, we remember we all had the conversation in Vegas and y'all told me some stuff that I didn't know. Like I did, I kind of knew, but I didn't know. I didn't even know about the old, the overdose and all that stuff really. Yeah, because initially we had kept it quiet. Yeah, co- completely. And it right. was like, when you know, I'm one of the people, like if people don't know this, it's like I've been there since day one, and I'm one of the people that keeps, <laughs> I'm going to keep shit under the wraps. You're never going to get anything out of me, really. You know, you can always get a piece of something and you speculate it, but it's like you have an information. So I don't, but I'm one of those people where it's like I know the protocol was built by all the shit we went through. <laughs> so, right. But you ended up doing more production on recovery. recovery. Yes. Right. Cause, cause relapse was like, there's a lot of um, inspiration of Dre. It's just yeah. Dre. And there's a lot yeah, of things. Dre and Marshall. Yep. So during that time, remember is, is, is it was, you know, remember 50 came in that week and it was a lot of songs him and 50 had. I think they had like two or three records that that, that they did during that time. In Back Vegas? fourth joints. Yeah. Yeah, well, one of them ended up being, we we just put it out, the Is This Love record. Yeah, yeah. That yeah. was like, they were, they, during that time, it was a lot more records too like that they had. Is but, This Love was on, on Curtain Call too, so yep. very apropos for this discussion. So on on Recovery, mm-hmm. you did... I did um, On Fire. Right. I felt like at this time... Remember, On Fire was him coming out of the accents. And I remember like, yo, bro, let's just do it like hip hop shop, straightforward, no accent, bop, 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 bop. Yeah, he was spitting, just straight spitting on it. Straight And then you also did a bunch of stuff on the Bad Meets Evil project, right? Yeah, I did most of that, yep. And you were one of the co-producers of that. So so tell me about that because- Obviously, there's there was a long history, you know, Royce that was sort of not not separate, well, separate but parallel mm-hmm. to the D12 stuff. Mm-hmm. He had his own relationship with Royce, mm-hmm. which you know we talked about it very very briefly when I had my podcast with Royce. Mm-hmm. But at some point, Royce comes back into the fold, and 
you guys all patch things up, everybody's cool, mm-hmm. and they start working on Bad Meets Evil and yeah. brought you in. What did that mm-hmm. feel like? Well, the story goes, after Proof, I remember talking to Royce in 2007. Yeah. I heard a song him and Primo did, and I said, yo, you need to do a whole album with Prem. This was back, back. So at this point, I already squashed everything myself because Proof, we lost Proof. And it was kind of like I remember that time. So I kind of already myself was like, man, we too, we grown. We got to grow past a lot of this shit. And then later it became more into So so Roy Star come to the studio. He had the slaughterhouse thing. He had all of that. And I remember working with him like, yo, you don't, you just got to hone in on this shit. Like, and we did success is certain. We did all of that kind of stuff in my studio. Down the right. street, the one that was in Oak Park, from down the street, from Vanguard, ironically. Yeah, yeah I remember that. You so had your then, own spot. Yeah. So then we go to, I think we went to Brazil, Paul, or something. And I remember we was on the plane, and me and Royce had already had some songs, because I was working on another project with him. Yeah. And then you was like, how about a Bad Meets Evil album? <laughs> right. Like, right. Yeah. Royce said the same thing. Th- yeah. Don't I was like, you guys, why, why don't we just make this a real project? And it was, yeah. it was an EP actually. Yeah. Yeah. But why not? It was the right time. It was in yeah. between Eminem albums. Yep. Those guys were on a roll creatively. Yeah. It felt like the right thing to do. Yeah. It was, so, it was perfect time. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. That comes out massively successful. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we continue uh, forward from there and we go from, Relapse to the Marshall Mathers LP too, right? Yes. Yep. And what which records did you do on there? Because I think you I set out on those because I started focusing during Bad Means Evil, right after Bad Means Evil, I really I don't know if you remember this conversation. It was like I really wanted to get the shows down pat. Yeah. I felt and I was like, Yo, you, you gotta- took over. I mean, this this is an important thing to bring up. We're running out of time, but that's mm-hmm. why I'm rushing through this stuff. But an yeah. important thing to bring up is you took over the duties of being on stage with Marshall at the live yeah. shows. Yeah. And, and, that, and, and that's a job. It's like a real job. It's and it's wanna- it's a serious gig. And yeah. and thank goodness we have had you to do it because, yeah. you know, not that many people can do it. No, I had to take that time because I really noticed how this needed to be better. And I'm, I want to be good at whatever. I don't have to be th- the greatest person that ever done something. My thing is like, I'm there. I'm a great six man. That's how I look at it. So I started focusing a lot more on the show shit. So during the Marshall Mathers 2, I was like, man, this is, let me just not worry about production wise. And I think we had, obviously we have records. We always right. make records for everything, but kind of sat back off that one so then moving forward obviously it's revival kamikaze Mm -hmm. music Mm -hmm. to be murdered by music to be murdered by the b-sides yeah all the stuff in between what do you what do you feel like you were you were most focused on with marshall on those projects revival i wanted him to get in the room and just create Mm -hmm. instead of you know just getting it back in the room i was like yo bro let's that was at the height of a lot of things happening socially. And it was like, we talk about that so much. Like, that's how Untouchable and things like that, you know, we did the... Right, you were, I mean, you worked on Untouchable. Yeah, Untouchable. Remember the campaign joint, the, 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 the campaign joint speech? We worked on that. Yep. And then that whole revival idea was like, hey, Paul, let's... let's me, Mill, and me and Mill and uh, Mark Batson, let's put... Let's go in, let us go in, and boom, 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 boom. Yep. Work on records and just try to like get them back into a different fold. Now that was, I think people are gonna go back and look at that. That's a very critical record. There's critical of it when it comes to certain things, but I think yeah. it was critical because it was a risk. You know the risk. Yeah, that, that it was. We know what it took. Right. But, we talked about it a little bit with Marshall, and and he feels like it was unfairly treated because when the track list came out. Mm-hmm. And it had all these features on it with like bigger names and some pop artists. Yeah. People had a preconceived notion of what the record was going to be. Yeah, they looked over the content completely. And decided so. that it was going to be something before they'd even heard it. Yeah. Right. Which is why moving forward, he was like, I'm not going to let that happen again. I'm going to hit mm-hmm. them with these albums. They're not going to know when they're coming. They're not knowing when they're coming. Yeah. Right. So then we yeah. go to Kamikaze. 
mm-hmm. and then the music to be murdered by records. Yeah. And you you obviously were around for those. Mm-hmm. What do you remember from from their creations? I remember how Kamikaze was. It was like he it was exactly what it it was very self explanatory. That's what he was feeling. Yeah. And, you know, obviously we had conversations about some records that we didn't weren't gonna use. Uh huh. Yeah. He was firing back at the world. Yeah. But yeah. then he not did all it the over world deserved to be fired back at. Listen, bro, when he did it over that one joint, I was like, all right, enough is enough. I'm like, I just gave you a smash. Remember, the, like the way up joint, and you chose to what you chose to do. It was like, come on, man, are you really gonna do that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Over this, so, so it, it was so, just creatively, he's gotten to a place. I feel like when it came to Kamikaze, he really started getting the idea of recording and just being able to let go of things and not harbor right. too long. Right, and then the most recent futures, obviously the the music to be murdered by records, yes, and those were born from the same sort of creative space. What is your understanding or remembrance of you know how you guys approach those records? I think the 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 one thing is music to be murdered by was like he got back into theme, just you know having a theme of what he was going to do. Yeah, back into like a character almost into a character. Yeah, yeah. and that was relief a relief because you know we love that from him obviously yeah. and then it's not it's not as big of a fight remember with some of the songs like him pulling stuff that he probably shouldn't use because it's like i remember this record let me rehash this one and back. yeah really, it wasn't you know, him like fire those those albums weren't him firing back at the world full yeah. bore necessarily like that yeah it was back to yeah us you know just creating to create yeah. and that's yep. where he you know where he's at his best create absolutely you know? Absolutely. So listen, that brings us to present day. You guys are obviously going to create more. Yes. Remain friends. Yeah. Hopefully go out and do some more shows at yeah. some point. We we're gonna have to one day. You know, that's the that's the thing. He knows that. <laughs> Yeah, well, of course. You know, you know, of course. Like, it's just yeah, like, just, right, COVID, right now, COVID was the best and worst thing to happen to it him, was right? the best and worst thing. Listen, right. for all of us, because we all got into a way. So. so, Mr. Porter, listen, our time here is up. I just wanted to thank you. We got way, way deep into some stuff early on yeah. that I didn't expect to get into, but I'm really glad we did because I think we covered a lot of things that people didn't know and a few things that I didn't know. Yeah, which I is, like that. You which know is amazing. A lot of shit. <laughs> Which is just amazing. And I'm so glad that you were able to join us. What do you want to say to the people listening through these platforms and around the world? Now's your moment. <laughs> Now's your moment. Listen, only thing I, my, my main stay is we are all leaving Earth in a box. Don't let people make you live in one. There you go. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Porter on the Paul Pod. It's been Thank incredible. You. Thank you so much. Appreciate you, brother. I'll see you soon. Yes, sir.